Okay, we're moving into the second panel, um, contested rules of the game, governing through hierarchies and networks. Um, I thought we started off really well this morning. One thought I had was that we tended to sort of run rather quickly between sort of multilateralism on the one hand and very general notions of order on the other hand, and filling in more on where exactly the sites of contestation are going to be and who precisely is involved in that contestation is one of the places I hope we might be able to go um, a little bit more in these next sessions. Um, I'm Andy Hurrell. I've been asked to chair this session. Um, we're just going to move through as we did this morning um, in the order on the program. So beginning with Amitabh Acharya from the American University, then moving on to Miles Kaler from UC San Diego, to Michael Zürn from Berlin, um, to Juan Fontenegueda from here, um, Iri Bricks Policy Center, and then finally, last but not least, of course, um, Daniel Flemes from Giga and from here as well. So let's just move straight into the session. We've got two hours. Try to keep to 15 minutes um, each of the presentations so we have some time for uh, the discussion. Um, Amitabh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you, the organizers, uh, for inviting me for, uh, to my very first trip uh, south of the United States. So I'm really privileged to be in Brazil. Uh, I do have a paper, but I do accept that uh, it came in very late, so I don't assume that uh, you would have a chance to read. So I'll try to uh, briefly comment from the paper uh, and highlight the key points. Uh, my, I guess the theme of my paper is somewhat similar to what uh, Richard, uh, the earlier panel, uh, had addressed, the question of hegemony. But uh, we do have some, uh, some similarities and some differences in our approach and views. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, the, when we look at the post, uh, well, the emerging world order, let's say uh, the order that is uh, uh, unfolding before us, uh, there are, and at least since uh, the end of the Cold War, there have been a variety of ways in which academics and uh, pundits have tried to describe it. So we have terms like a multipolar, one of the most common terms. There are terms like uh, apolar or nonpolar, uh, neopolar, and of course Charlie Kupchan's uh, no one's land. Uh, a variety of ways that have been used to describe it. And um, sort of taking off from that, uh, let me start by looking at so what was the debate about the end of the Cold War and the emerging multi multipolarity, which was kind of in the 1990, 91, before the, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait and the US led counterattack on Saddam, before the New World Order, before the unipolar moment. People thought the world is going to be multipolar. And, uh, and uh, again, depending on what idea, uh, theoretical perspective you take, uh, it will be stable or unstable. And uh, the neorealist, particularly John Mearsheimer, thought uh, the post-Cold uh, uh, post, uh, War period, the multipolar era, will be unstable for Europe. And uh, Aaron Friedberg said the same thing about Asia, and the Asia under multipolarity would be very unstable. Uh, then we had a uh, succession of commentaries. We had the unipolar moment, uh, Charles Krauthammer after uh, the US victory in Iraq. But he was careful to say it will be a moment rather than an era. Then we had debates uh, between people like Christopher Lane, uh, who talked about the unipolar illusion, that unipolarity will not last, will be replaced by rising powers, multipolarity. And then we had uh, uh, Bill Wolcott talking about unipolar stability, and the argument that unipolarity will be stable and in fact will last very long. Uh, so now, if I look at this debate, there were some common features uh, of this debate. First of all, a lot of this was uh, very structural, that uh, sort of the distribution of power in the system shapes uh, international order, meaning conflict or stability. Uh, second, if you again look at it very carefully, especially the lane all for debate, a lot of the examples they were giving about whether unipolarity is stable or multipolarity is unstable, uh, they were all drawn from Europe uh, very, very clearly. Uh, from European uh, historiography. Uh, the, the other thing uh, was that uh, there was not much discussion, especially in that debate, 
uh, about uh, regional orders. I mean, there are others who are working on regions, Charlie and Andrew, Andrew Hural, but in that debate, regional orders were not very uh, prominent. Then most recently, uh, and at that time, by the way, uh, the American decline debate has kind of faded. Uh, the decline debate was, uh, of course, very prominent in the 1980s uh, with uh, the rise and fall of great powers, uh, the, the, that book. But when the United States, uh, after the Iraq war in 91, uh, that debate receded to the background and the unipolar moment took care of the American decline debate. Uh, so now what has happened in the last few years, we have a kind of a slight change in the, or actually a big change in the discourse. And uh, so part of the discourse is the idea of a, a liberal Leviathan, uh, 2011, 2010 book, 2011 I think, of uh, John Eikenberry, uh, makes a very strong argument that uh, even if the United States is in decline, the order that the United States built was going to uh, exert a very significant influence. Onto the future, it might even uh, co-opt. Uh, it does, it's not definitive about it, but it might even co-opt the rising powers. At the same time, the decline debate has come back, especially after the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. But there are differences between the new decline debate uh, and the old decline debate, as I call it the fall and rise of the decline, American decline debate. The, new decl the old decline debate uh, was about uh, imperial overstretch. The United States is too overstretched like all other great powers in history, and it's going to uh, sort of, uh, suffer the consequences of this uh, overstretch. The post-2008 post decline debate is more about uh, domestic problems of the United States. It started with the housing bubble and the economic crisis, and uh, so the argument is that the United States is being, uh, uh, being undermined from within, not so much from without. Although there are rising powers, but the real threat is actually from within. And another difference is that uh, people are, talking about uh, China uh, in the old decline debate, uh, Paul uh, Kennedy and all, they were talking a little, little bit about Japan, much more about Japan than China. Now, of course, uh, China is front and center about who can rival the United States. So the, the, the issue then is uh, uh, which view is uh, likely to prevail. And of course, it's far too early. And I do not take sides on the decline debate. The US decline debate is uh, ongoing, is indeterminate and uh, it can go either way. Uh, there have been good studies done by the National Intelligence Council and uh, the European Union Institute of uh, Security Studies. They have done a parallel study of uh, world in 2030. And I think the, the conclusion there, which I am persuaded with some reservations, that the United States will, not, uh, will remain important, but will not be the sort of hegemonic in all uh, sense of the term, uh, like uh, the post-1990 period, immediate post-Cold War period. The United States will be one of the great powers, maybe first among equals, but it's not going to have that kind of uh, uh, influence, uh, that kind of power. And especially, uh, the United States will remain uh, most likely a military power, number one military power, but the economic power uh, uh, will not be uh, American monopoly. The Chinese are about, uh, will be poised to take over as the world's number one economy, at least in TPP terms and, uh, and uh, by 2030, and uh, therefore we will have really significant diffusion of power. The United States will not get its own way on uh, some of the, a lot of the things. Now, my quest, uh, uh, my, my taking off from there, my argument is, uh, pretty, first I focus on this idea of a uh, Eikenberry argument. Uh, whether the, he uses a variety of terms to describe it. Uh, one of the terms is called American-led liberal hegemonic order. Uh, there are other terms he uses sometimes, the Atlantic, the West, American world order, American uh, liberal order. But the term that I focus on is the American late liberal hegemonic order. And uh, whether that will cast a long shadow onto the future and might even co-opt the uh, emerging powers. We have heard about on this question earlier on, uh, Karen and others have spoken about it. And I'm in agreement with them, but I just add a couple of things uh, wh 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 where, where my position stands. Uh, first of all, again, it's a very stylized, uh, Eikenberry's presentation is very stylized. Uh, other uh, fellow liberals or people who believe in that, like uh, Andy, for example, would not characterize it that way. So we do agree that there are differences within that liberal camp about what to call the order. Uh, but uh, if we accept the stylized version of uh, John Eikenberry, then uh, I think there is a conflation between the American-led order or what I call American world order, and the world order itself. 
Uh, there are a lot of countries, a lot of regions uh, who are outside of the order, were not present at the creation, who didn't uh, accept uh, at least uh, the order in its totality, and sometimes even registered it. And a country like uh, China, for example, before 1979, the, the USSR, uh, they are not a uh, part of it. Uh, and many parts of the non-aligned world, uh, developing world, or the what is called third world, not part of it. They even registered it. Now, what does it mean is that uh, they did not have a sense of ownership of that order. It was not very inclusive. It was certainly not global. So that means it did become more global after the uh, end of the Cold War, when China uh, took to capitalism, India had economic reforms, and, uh, and, and the like. But even then, the fact that these countries were not present at the creation, they didn't uh, really participate in the making of the rules of the order, does make a difference. That they won't have the same sense of ownership, I believe. They would like to, if not challenge it frontally, but are not actually uh, try to reform it or change it. Uh, the other thing is that I think uh, Eikenberry presents a very benign picture of that order. And again, we heard about this uh, in Karen's paper in the African context, but we can apply it to other parts of the world, including this, uh, Asia. The order was, uh, not, uh, was uh, kind of selective in its application of its uh, principles like human rights and democracy. It was not bereft of conflict. The Cold War was not a long peace uh, in any sense of the term, if you take into account internal and regional conflicts. And, uh, and, and also, it was not uh, really, uh, it didn't have enjoy universal legitimacy. So, <coughs> so can it then co-opt uh, the emerging powers today? I mean, uh, Charlie Kupchan has written about this extensively, and I'm uh, in agreement with him. My uh, conclusion, basically, is that it cannot. Uh, because these uh, uh, emerging powers will want to have their stamp on, uh, on that order, change the rules and norms to the best possible way, even they do not, even if they do not ex totally subvert that order. But to call it as a set of the original uh, order in its original form is uh, a bit too optimistic, I would say. Uh, but then if the American, I mean, my conclusion is the United States may remain like a mammoth rather than a leviathan, or even an elephant rather than a mammoth. Mammoths do get extinct, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> elephants survive. Uh, now, what about the emerging powers? Now, I, uh, looking at this literature, uh, I think there is a lot of hype about emerging powers. And uh, first of all, we are not in agreement about uh, who are the emerging powers. And Andy Cooper has said it's an evolving, contested uh, notion. Uh, and there is no uh, coherence among the group. Uh, and also, the capacity of these emerging powers to provide for public goods uh, is limited as yet. Uh, and uh, either singly or collectively, the, the bricks don't have much cement gl uh, gluing them together when it comes to important issue areas. And also, I think uh, most of the, not all, but most of the emerging powers suffer from what I call a regional legitimacy deficit, that they're not trusted by their neighbors. Uh, and China is a classic example at the moment where uh, it has a territorial dispute with uh, most of its neighbors. Uh, except the Central Asian countries, which it has solved. But it has maritime uh, land disputes, uh, land disputes with India, maritime disputes with Southeast Asia, with Japan. So I think those regional concerns, a uh, uh, lack of regional legitimacy, uh, is going to drag China or keep it from becoming a truly global power. And it, this can be applied to many other regional powers as well, or the emerging powers as well. So my, one of my arguments is that regional legitimacy and support uh, if you don't have it, it's going to constrain your global role. You cannot have a global aspiration and expect it to be fulfilled unless you have at least um, much of the region to go with you and support you. Uh, so uh, moving on then, wh what about regional walls? This is another possibility. Uh, people like Peter Kartenstein have written about uh, a world of regions. The world is becoming regionalized. Now this works positively and negatively. Some people think a regional world order or a series of regional orders is a good thing. Uh, it's a stepping stone to global order, and uh, others think oh, it's uh, scary. I mean, uh, if you look at, again, John Eikenberg's book, he thinks regionalism is disruptive. It's, fragment it's a fragmentation of the global order. Uh, and he almost thinks that it's not compatible with uh, the liberal order, which I think Andy will disagree with, I th reading his work. But uh, he actually makes it very clear. The alternative to the liberal, liberal hegemonic world order is fragmentation and regional blocks. Now this is actually a misnomer because the nature of regionalism has changed. The kind of regionalism, the classical liberals like uh, uh, maybe uh, Franklin Roosevelt feared when he uh, 
uh, vouched for a universal collective security system was that these regional blocks are exclusionary, they are a balance of power arrangements, and they are not open to each other. They're like secret alliances kind of thing. But today, regionalism has changed. We not only have a proliferation of regional organizations, uh, but we, they're also much more inclusive, they're much more open, and there's a great deal of what is called inter-regionalism, uh, partly induced by the EU, but by other, uh, other regions. Uh, and those, uh, that inter-regionalism prevents the regional blocks from being exclusive and, uh, and, and, and limited and uh, kind of balance of power arrangements. So, so, yes. so, so, um, so the regionalism does provide, therefore, a kind of a more uh, 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 kind of a stepping stone of some sorts to a global order and sort of acknowledges the diversity that undoubtedly exists among our countries and, and, and among regions. But will regionalism by itself be sufficient? And I also don't believe that uh, a world of regions can uh, substitute for global order. It will be one of the elements, but it will not be uh, the whole. So where does it lead us to? Uh, some people think, well, the future of world order might be like a coalition or a concert between the established powers and the emerging powers, like something that we might find uh, to some degree in the G20. But again, the concert arrangement uh, is not very convincing, and I'm sure some of you agree with me that G20 is not a real concert, uh, as the way the concert of power operated uh, in the 19th century. Well, uh, so, so, uh, so, we don't, so we don't have a concert system, we don't have a, a world of regions, so something, a hybrid has to happen, something in between, and I call it a multiplex world. Now, a multiplex world comes out of the idea of a cinema, which many of you and many of us have been to, where you have three, three characteristics. First is that uh, there are several movies, several scripts going at the same time uh, under the same hall. Secondly, uh, there's no single director or single movie uh, that dominates for all time. They dominate for a while, then they give way to new movies. And you can have a, a number of different themes, like you know, Hollywood versus Bollywood. I mean, you have song and dance, you have uh, uh, movies that are Western and uh, full of guns and violence, you have kung fu movies, uh, you would have uh, melodramas. I think you will have a variety of scripts coming along. But third and not, not the least important is the fact that a multiplex still has a sense of interdependence. It's under one roof, I mean, at least the ones that I've been to. And sometimes they even have a same security system, entry and exit system, you just go to different uh, the screens. So there is a sense of interdependence, but there are, there's no one script that is running, and that, as the audience have more of a choice about what uh, they want to see and what they don't want to see. And uh, the other thing I talk about is that when you talk about world order, we look, look, look at four dimensions. So I call it a multiplex cinema with 4D movies. Uh, the first D, of course, is height, which is the classical notion of power. And here, hard power, I think it still matters, uh, and uh, you cannot count it out. Uh, but uh, it's also important to look at the length, which is the second dimension. Here, as I said, unlike the liberal hegemonic world order, which did not include a great part of the world, uh, many regions were excluded, regionalism were distrusted. For me, bringing regions, bringing also some non-state actors is the question of height. You sort of have a more inclusive notion, sorry, length, uh, of how, how far that order extends. Uh, then depth, to me, is the third dimension, and that look, looks at quality of uh, leadership, quality of uh, 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 the defining principles and norms and a sense of interdependence, uh, which is also very important. Here we find that now uh, the United States has some of it, but not all of it, and the emerging powers have it in varying degrees. Uh, so, 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 so the depth is important. And the final dimension is time. Here we often find time has two meanings to me. One is that we should never assume any order is going to be permanent, just like the unipolar moment is ending sooner than uh, Krothammer has expected. Uh, but uh, also, uh, anything that replaces it is not going to last. I mean, Kenneth Wall said that uh, Cold War might last for very long because bipolar orders are more stable than multipolar ones. But the uh, Cold War ended before anybody had anticipated. So we should be very humble about expecting, we should look at the points of origin and points of end of orders. And secondly, we should not assume that history repeats itself. That's the question of uh, historical time. That uh, Europe's past, uh, whether multiple or Europe was uh, a conflictual and uh, bipolar Cold War was stable. I mean, these things do not necessarily explain the future. What we see today is a very different world and uh, the world is that we have several great powers, several emerging powers and power, regional power centers existing simultaneously and interacting closely. 
uh, in the past, and I think Charlie touched on Max, uh, at this point in his book, that in the past we had the empires, uh, the Mughals and the Qing and uh, uh, in Ottomans, and they were great power centers, but they never interacted as closely as all the emerging powers are, the, uh, are interacting today. So we are in a fundamentally different world. So I will end up with a Star Trek uh, sort of a, uh, analogy that uh, we, instead of pining for the restoration or the revival or a resurrection of the American-led hegemonic world order, we should boldly go where nobody has gone before. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Jennifer. So now let me uh, hand the floor to Miles Taylor, who can take us to where we've never been before. <laughs> Well, in fact, um, I am going to take us in a slightly different direction <laughs> because the, the conversation up to this point has been, um, has been quite statist in a way. And so I'm going to be talking about uh, new modes of global governance. Go ahead. And I think I have animation of the slide. So why don't you just keep, keep going down until we've completed the slide. That will be easier for you, our, our excellent tech support here. Um, I had animation that I could not take out of the slides quickly enough. So keep going. OK. so. Um, Obviously, th there's been a lot of attention in the last decade in particular about uh, new modes of global governance and new things that are happening in global governance. And one of them is obviously the theme of this conference, which is the rise of the emerging economies. I prefer the term large emerging economies to BRICS because I exclude Russia from this group. I don't think it's similar in many, many ways. Uh, I do not include South Africa, unfortunately, in my account because these three large, very complicated countries are already stretching the limits of my very limited expertise. So um, my apologies to the South African um, members of the, of the uh, conference. But I think these, these arguments could be applied, and the reason I use LEEs is could be applied to Indonesia, to Turkey, and other uh, large emerging economies as well. They're not exclusively for Brazil, India, China. Um, the second change has been, of course, and this gets to the status point, the enfranchisement and the activity in global governance of non-state actors, NGOs, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, and also multinational corporations. There's the, it seems to me the two big clusters of actors that have been driving a lot of what's happening in global governance. Um, there have been many typologies about these new developments. They've been called informal. They have been um, called um, RSS is the term that Abbott and Snydel use, which is uh, uh, I can't even remember what the acronym stands for at this point, but there, there are many, many typologies out there. So I, as, as always happens in international relations, I'm creating my own typology, which people in international relations love to do. And what I've done is essentially taken some of the, uh, borrowed a lot from what other people have written, uh, very fine work that's been done, and tried to strip it down and make it, uh, give it a sort of an analytic frame. So essentially what I will be looking at is four modes of, new modes of global governance that move beyond what I call the IGO model. And what do I mean by that? The intergovernmental organization model includes the actors or the principles in these organizations are states. Uh, they are multilateral. They're not clubs. They, they're they're quasi-universal. Uh, centralized and legalized institutional design and relatively weak supranationalism. So I'm not talking about the European Union when I say the IGO model. Think about the IMF or the WTO. That is kind of the ideal type that I'm talking about. The new modes of government, in some sense, governance move beyond the IGO model in step by step in different ways. Um, informal governance rules within existing IGOs. Informal clubs that produce soft law rather than hard binding obligations of various kinds. Network governance, which is a very large category, and I'll be talking specifically about transnational, uh, transgovernmental networks. And then finally, hybrid or private governance, which means non-state actors are involved. So in some sense, we move step by step away from the IGO model to the last step, which is when you include non-state actors. The first three categories really are still state-centric, but different than the IGO model, the kind of classic or ideal type of the IGO model. And the question I ask is, are these developments related, particularly the rise of the large emerging economies and these new modes of governance. And the conclusion, just to jump ahead to the conclusion, is that no, they're not completely related in the sense that the new actors in the form of the large emerging economies have distinct preferences over these new modes of governance. And, uh, and they present different advantages and disadvantages to them. Uh, and those are the things that I'll be talking about uh, in the rest of this discussion. I should point out from the outset, I do talk about one form of global governance which all of the emerging economies are highly resistant to, and that's hierarchy. So if in any of these forms of global governance there is even a whiff 
of US or Western hierarchy, in other words, delegated authority to the United States to make decisions on behalf of other states, the large emerging economies are basically not in that game. Uh, they don't want any part of it, typically. But I'm leaving that aside because uh, that's not a very interesting category since, generally speaking, they're not going to be involved in it. They've never been involved, any of them, in the US alliance system, for example, uh, which is perhaps the most hierarchical uh, governance structure in, in, in the world uh, since the Cold War. So let's move to the next slide, and you can just go down each of the bullets. This is a, a category that has been developed by Randy Stone um, uh, in, in some recent books, uh, the latest one coming out two years ago called Controlling Institutions, and essentially he has been writing for some time about the, the puzzle as to why, given that the United States has only 18% of the voting rights, for example, in the IMF, does it seem to exercise such overwhelming influence within the IMF? and other global institutions, well beyond what the formal rules or the formal structures would, would tell us. And basically, he argues that the United States has certain structural power, which means that when its interests, its core interests are at stake, it can convince other members of the institution to go along with its point of view or its preferences, uh, even though it doesn't, in some sense, deserve that level of influence given its formal voting power. Uh, the question I ask in this section of the paper is, do the large emerging economies have this kind of structural power yet in the, uh, the existing intergovernmental organizations, and basically, I would say at this point, probably not. They don't have the kind of outside options that the United States can threaten to exercise, which is really the source of American power in these institutions. Stone's more controversial conclusion is that as these organizations do develop more egalitarian power structures, as the emerging economies in particular develop a larger formal role in them, there will be more efforts to place legalization and other types of constraints on the United States as the dominant power. And he uses the example of the European Union, which is a much more a flatter power structure as one that leads to more legalization, more constraints on the bigger members. Um, the other alternative, which he doesn't consider, is of course that the emerging economies could become block holders major shareholders in these institutions like the United States and want their own informal rules of influence, which is one possibility. And there's also the possibility that these, uh, these governments will not want to have a more legalized, more formal set of rules just because they have their own preferences for more informal modes of global governance and less constraint on national policy for reasons of sovereignty. And that brings me to the next category. Next slide. This is a more interesting category because it's much more widespread, and that is the, the development of informal clubs of various kinds or informal groups of countries that don't produce binding treaties, binding obligations uh, on states, but rather produce soft law. Um, informal understandings, gentlemen's agreements, conventions of various kinds, but they don't have binding legal force, typically. And the best example of this is the one that Amitav has just spoken about, which is the G20 but there are many other examples as well. There's no question that the large emerging economies have become very, very heavily engaged with existing international organizations. Uh, you can look at the membership figures for China, which is the most striking case from 1980 to the present day. Uh, its membership and engagement has gone up uh, exponentially, you could say. And, and it's not simply membership for membership's sake, it's actually engagement, activity. And I mentioned in the, um, uh, in the paper, the example of the WTO, where these governments joined in some cases without really wanting to join in 1995 when the US and the EU in some sense twisted their arms to get them into the WTO, but now have become quite active members, uh, participating actively in the dispute settlement mechanism, bringing complaints, being the target of complaints. Uh, so they're active in these legalized organizations, but their preference, I would argue, is for limited legalization. If, we're crea if, if one is creating a new organization, for example, Organizations in which states are members, in which the membership criteria are often very vague. That's the case with the G20. No one quite knows why any country is in the G20, except that those who are in it like being in it. Um, and that the decision making is by consensus generally. The, the voting rules are often very unclear if they're stipulated at all. And, and they have been quite enthusiastic supporters of the G20 as an alternative, obviously, to the G7. I mention also another example in the paper, which is the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD. And this is an interesting case about, which gets to some of the questions we talked about this morning, as to whether these kind of informal soft law organizations can build consensus across the divide between the OECD countries and the new emerging economy, the rising powers. 
the record, as I point out in the paper for the Development Assistance Committee, which does not create binding rules about development assistance. It has built up a whole set of understandings among aid donors about how aid should be administered, uh, what are the criteria, good governance for, is one example, is a recent one that has been added to the list. And the DAC has been reaching out to the, uh, the new aid donors, who are the large emerging economies, uh, China, India, Brazil in particular, and trying to get them to engage with this process of building a consensus about development assistance. As I point out in the paper, this has been a very mixed record so far, um, because these new, actually re-emerging aid donors, as someone has pointed out, they've been aid donors for a long time, India and China, but they're re-emerging as large-scale donors. Um, they have a very different set of motivations for their aid, uh, their aid programs. Typically, the commercial side of it is much more uh, powerful or more prominent. Um, and what you see in this process within the DAC is, I would argue, a, a dynamic that you can see in other issue areas as well, which is northern NGOs are pushing the governments of the OECD in a particular direction, which is to tighten up constraints and norms in the area of development assistance. Um, and the large emerging economies are moving in a very different, much more commercially motivated direction. And really, the two sides don't have a great deal to talk about at this point uh, within the DAC. And so this record of building consensus through a soft law type of mechanism in this particular case has not been um, tremendously successful up to this point. Now, it's important to note when we talk about China, and China's gotten a lot of criticism in the area of development assistance, that the norms and the rules and the conventions are kind of vague. So it's not always clear who's violating whose norms in these cases. And that's one of the both advantages and disadvantages of soft law organizations. Next slide, please. The third very large category, and I've narrowed it down to transgovernmental networks, is, is networks generally in international politics as an alternative, and how should the, the BICs or the large emerging economies respond to these? Um, from their point of view, compared to intergovernmental organizations, they have certain advantages. Transgovernmental networks are networks among sub-agencies sub or agencies of national governments across national borders. And there are many of them, and many have argued, though there's no great data, in fact, there's not a lot of data on all these new modes of governance, there's no, not a lot of data to support it, but that these have exploded in, in the recent decades, uh, these types of connections, but they've existed for quite some time among the industrialized countries. So the advantages for, from the point of view of the emerging economies is they're, they're less demanding, they're often very narrow in scope, focused on a particular issue area, their, their decision-making is almost by definition consensus decision-making. If you don't like what's going on in the network, you can simply leave. And there's very low legalization. So whatever commitments or understandings take place in a TGN is, is not going to be a legalized commitment. The disadvantages from their point of view is that these networks necessarily rely on trust because there is no authority over the network to determine uh, who is right and wrong in any dispute. Therefore, there are barriers to newcomers because you may not trust newcomers, and there are limits to the size of these networks typically because of this reliance on trust. The role of the incumbent powers, as I call them, the United States and the EU, is, is overwhelmingly uh, present. In other words, there is a, a view out there that these networked forms of organization are necessarily more advantageous to newcomers and more open, in some sense, accessible but in fact, they are full, they are full of power in, <laughs> in a very real sense. There are some nodes in the network that are much more powerful than others. And in the case of the central banks, it's the United States Federal Reserve, as we have seen in recent months, where just the mention of a change in monetary policy in the United States has created chaos in many of the emerging markets, financial uh, uh, markets. So throughout the crisis, it was quite clear that the US Federal Reserve was the key node, and its immediate collaborators were the central banks of Europe, to a lesser degree, Japan. And then beyond that core, the trust was much lower. And so when emerging economies came to the Federal Reserve in October of 2008, as I described in the paper, the Federal Reserve said, well, we'll take Singapore and we'll take Brazil, but we're not gonna take Peru as a partner in our network. Uh, so they were quite clear they were gonna, and China remains on the margins of this central bank network for reasons I described in the pa paper, particularly questions of trust and transparency, which is another barrier to, uh, to network participation. So the final category, which in many ways is the most interesting, is, is the category in which non-state actors become involved. And here I would return to a theme that was uh, characteristic of some of the papers this morning about the variation across the large emerging economies, and particularly 
it seems to me the key variable here is the relations between each government and its NGO sector, both domestic NGOs and international NGOs who operate in those countries. Um, and here I would be very happy to get comments from the audience because I do not claim a great deal of expertise on NGOs. I started working on this topic very recently. But the contrast I make in the paper is between Brazil and China with uh, India somewhere in between. And one can see in a number of issue areas where the Brazilian government has quite shrewdly and strategically and I think well used its NGO sector and also INGOs as an international resource in these new modes of governance in which NGOs are involved. And there are many of these. Uh, once again, there's been an explosion of these types of governance, both hybrid and purely non-governmental forms of governance uh, internationally over the last decade or decade and a half. The Chinese government is, uh, the Indian government is somewhere in between these two. Um, I was talking to Schumit this morning. The, the relations between, to my surprise, I discovered the relations between the Indian government and its NGO sector are tenuous at best and often conflictual. Um, and the NGO sector in India is much less internationalized and much more domestically focused. So the linkages to INGOs are much weaker. In China, um, even though it's an authoritarian state and quite suspicious of civil society organizations, there has been also an explosion of NGOs. And in all these societies, Brazil, India, China, the numbers of NGOs have grown enormously over the last decade or two. But China as well, since around 1995, has seen an explosion in the growth of NGOs, collaboration with international NGOs. Most of, for example, the major American environmental organizations have offices in China, which are staffed by Chinese nationals that are operating there. Um, nevertheless, um, the amount of leverage that the INGOs, the international NGOs, have in China is clearly limited by the government and by what the government needs. And particularly, there's been very limited adaptation by the Chinese government to these new modes of governance that include NGOs because of its difficult relationships with its own NGO sector. When I say NGO sector in China, in fact, many of what are called NGOs in China are gongos, governmental, non-governmental organizations. So they're tightly linked to government agencies. Uh, being registered as an NGO in China is extremely difficult, so many NGOs go on a sort of below-the-radar, non-registered non form. Um, and China, I argue, and for the Brazilians in the audience, of which there are many, I'm very optimistic about Brazil and this particular mode of government, governance because I think China is disadvantaged by not being able to mobilize its NGO sector effectively in many of the new modes of governance. Uh, and these new modes of governance are going to become more prominent as, as time goes on. So in conclusion, um, there's a parallel emergence here of the large emerging economies without an alignment by them or promotion by them of these new modes of governance. And I see the large emerging economies essentially on this question as conservatives. They like the IGO model. They prefer having states as their partners. But some of them are adapting more readily than others to the new modes of governance. And they've discovered as they enter these new modes of governance that the incumbent powers are there. These are not new in the sense that they're old rivals and adversaries among the incumbent powers. The United States, the EU, and Japan are absent. In fact, they are there. And many of these alternative modes of governance were created by the incumbent powers. So I argue that the growing influence of the, of the BICs or the large emerging economies will depend in large measure on their domestic resources that they're willing to devote. One is bureaucratic capacity, and particularly in transgovernmental networks, it seems to me that's very important. They're very high capacity types of, or, high maintenance types of organizations. Uh, their NGO sectors, as I've already mentioned, and the links that they're able to forge with the international NGOs. And the question of transparency and trust in many of these informal modes of organization. Because they are not legalized, because they do not have dispute settlement mechanisms, being able to trust your partner governance or your partners, whether they're non-governmental or governmental, is very important. And there, once again, I would say China is disadvantaged because if there's one shortcoming that China has in this area, it's transparency. Um, and everyone, everyone that negotiates with China tells the Chinese government that, but you know, this is something that is deeply embedded, I'm afraid, in the system. The risk is that the uh, emerging economies will work strenuously to get increased influence at the top level of the peak IGOs, which they've been doing, the IMF, the WTO, the World Bank. And in the meantime, that will become a shrinking portion of the overall landscape of global governance. And they'll miss, in some sense, miss the boat. Uh, and if you go to the last slide, you can see that they've made some um, Next slide. 
they've made a lot of progress on the peak organizations. Mr. Azevedo, who is now the new director general of the WTO, Min Zhu, who is the deputy managing director, one of the deputy managing directors at the IMF. And uh, the third party is very interesting, uh, Mr. Tsai, who is actually a Chinese national, but spent a lot of his time working at Goldman Sachs before he became head of the IFC. So that's an interesting, bringing us back to the BRICS theme and Goldman Sachs. Um, but he also is an example of the way the emerging economies have put their, are starting to put key people at the top of these peak organizations. Not the IMF yet, not the World Bank, but that will come. But I guess my final conclusion, as I say, is that that's not going to be enough. Uh, the new modes of governance will require an, an, an equal amount of energy and strategy and investment on the part of these economies. Great. Thank you very much. Obviously for the content and for the timekeeping. Um, Mikhail. Thank you. I, uh, I'm going to present uh, core ideas and let's say the conceptual frame of a collaborative uh, project that is uh, entitled Contested World Orders. And you will see, I won't take you anywhere else from where uh, Miles uh, took us. I'll stay there and explore a little bit uh, more on, on quite similar themes. I think with only with, with a lot of similarities and overlappings and, and some some differences as well. Uh, the basic idea is essentially if we talk about the coming world order, about contestation in world order, that the focus on rising powers only seems obviously not to suffice since uh, we have a very strange separation in our discipline as a whole. There is this talk about NGOs and global governance on the one hand, and the rising powers and the new world order on the other, and they speak very little to each other. Probably they do have sort of different ontological understandings of what international politics is, but this is not a reason to not to talk to each other since obviously they have one commonality which is absolutely decisive. Both of those groups speak essentially to international institutions. They put forward demands towards international institutions. And that is, by the way, a situation which distinguishes the current situation completely from earlier power transition periods when the rising powers put forward their demands towards the other rising powers. And there was no triadic uh, uh, situation as, as it seems to me we have today. Bismarck never asked any, any international institutions to change the uh, distribution of colonies, uh, he, he targeted essentially directly uh, the British Prime Minister, if I remember correctly at uh, this period. Um, so what, what I'm talking about is, that we, we can move to, to the next uh, slide, is the basic idea that we have the way to bring those two uh, different or these three different things together is uh, to say there are two changes both of them have created demands toward a change of world order, a contestation of world order. One is obvious, it's the one that we talk mainly about in this conference, that's the redistribution of international power, leading to a situation in which countries with little voice so far in the international system are empowered and have a stronger voice now. The second one is that the last two or three decades saw a period of what I would label the rise of international uh, authority uh, that covers some of those four types, I think not all. I will essentially focus on those kind of institutions which have established some form of competence that undermines the consensus principle uh, that have essentially structured international politics for a long, long time. So I'm not talking only about the supranational international governmental organizations. Uh, to the extent that, for example, NGOs are part of a human rights regime and they have completely independent monitoring uh, uh, capacities, uh, this is the results of what human rights reports uh, tells has some effects on states, but is not under the control of states. So that would be part of, of this broader uh, authority concept. And this kind of increased authority essentially leads to a situation where, as we know, since Max Weber, I would argue that any kind of political authority requires legitimacy. And uh, the, the rise of authority essentially therefore leads to a contestation of international institutions uh, via the notion of that if they exercise authority, they have to be legitimate. Uh, so that is the basic idea that those two different changes essentially empowered 
mainly two different types of actors, uh, and they uh, put forward different demands uh, towards international institutions, leading to a situation that is labeled here contestation of global governance or world order. Uh, the first one, we can move on, is, is extremely easy, and I will stay here only 10 seconds. Uh, it's just one of those hundreds of tables you know about uh, the, the, the rise of uh, new powers. Uh, I therefore move on and say a little bit what I mean, uh, the next one please, uh, what I mean with uh, international authority and why international institutions are increasingly, uh, or are getting increasingly contested and politicized. Um, as I said, to the extent that international institutions exercise authority, there is a demand for justification, uh, because when you exercise authority, you need to justify why you reduce the freedom of some other social actors. And that's essentially the whole basis of, 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 of legitimacy, uh, since uh, authority implies essentially the notion that you accept the judgment or the decision of an institution and essentially you follow it normally without challenging each of the single uh, uh, decisions or justifications. I mean, it, it becomes strange over time, you can challenge it, but normally the normal routine mode of accepting authority is that you essentially comply with uh, a statement of such an authority without persuasion taking place in the single case and without coercion taking place. Um, my third point here only briefly is that I would probably not distinguish so much those different constellation and types of global governance, but would at that point distinguish epistemic authority and political authority. Essentially political authority uh, referring to all those kind of uh, international institutions which make more or less binding decisions and epistemic authority essentially to those who provide data and interpretations about the real world which come as recommendations and which have an enormous influence then on uh, the, uh, the actors which are the targets of those uh, recommendations. In many cases this is not epistemic community emerging from a free competition of, let's say, scholars or something like this, it's very often politically assigned uh, 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 epistemic authority, like in the OECD, like uh, in the International Panel for Climate Change and so on. You have essentially a, a political decision to create an institution which exercises them or which has the task to exercise epistemic authority. And of course, to some extent, central banks and uh, constitutional courts fall into the same kind of so the argument, and we move on now, is that if we run through the policy cycle, you can see that there has been a certain rise of uh, uh, international authority, and I do this also very briefly. If it comes to the decision phase, uh, it is so that a majority of international organizations by now have the chance to decide by uh, a majority, not on all issues, but on some issues. Um, if it comes to monitoring, there has been a rise of a number of bodies that can act independently of the nation states, which are the targets of regulations. Traditionally, we have the self-reporting, which is, of course, the weakest form of monitoring. By now, we have the rise of all those NGOs, which to some extent play the function of monitoring, and we have some, uh, but a minority of international organizations which have independent capacity to do monitoring, like the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, very important in that respect is the rise of, of quasi-judicial bodies on, on the uh, international level with five times as many as in the 1960s. Uh, the uh, dispute settlement body of the WTO is probably the major example, but of course also the ICC uh, falls into this uh, category. Uh, even with respect to enforcement where we have clearly uh, least authority on the international level, there is some change in the sense that uh, the responsibility to protect involves a notion that the international community can enforce some things uh, against the will uh, of the concerned nation state, even by using uh, coercion. Uh, and I think the most relevant, or one of the most relevant developments is indeed the rise of those knowledge bodies that essentially exercise epistemic authority 
uh, there are by now hundreds of them, and, and some of them are very relevant in the sense that they begin to set the agenda, that they essentially define and structure uh, public debates within nation states. A, a very clear example in Europe, for example, is the OECD and its uh, rankings of the education systems with an enormous impact on, 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 on domestic debates. So having said this, uh, the, the argument is, if we move on, that there may be the possibility to capture each of the international institutions which are studied uh, by essentially having uh, two dimensions. One is the authority dimension. We can go for the next one. Uh, I mean, it's now roughly labeled as supranationalism, intergovernmentalism, and national discretion. On the other hand, you may distinguish the level to which uh, extend the institutional rules, ask states not to intervene into affairs, into affairs, I mean the classical WTO rules, don't uh, increase tariffs, don't do this, don't do that. And there are also increasingly, of course, some international institutions which ask for positive integration, uh, and that is essentially states are asked to do some things to achieve common goods. And, and that may be the liberal interventionist uh, uh, scale. So in the sense, it should be possible to, uh, to put each international institution uh, on, on a place in this scale and then essentially study a group of uh, rising powers and NGOs, which kind they pos position they take and how they differ from the status quo. That is the basic idea. There is a third dimension built in, which we talked about a lot this morning during the first session, and that is essentially the practice session. In many cases, there are demands that essentially do neither challenge the level of international authority, do, nor do they challenge the content of the rules. What they essentially challenge is the practice with which the rules are implemented and, and exercised. Uh, the idea that uh, there is uh, lack of representation, the idea that there is, uh, that alike cases are not treated alike and all those things. So you have to think essentially uh, uh, here in a, in a third dimension, uh, criticisms and demands put forward in order to change the practice without changing the level of authority or the level uh, of, of interventionism. With, with this in mind then, I skip the next one, which would be strategies and go on even one further. Uh, it is possible, I think, to test uh, some hypothesis. Uh, can you go on? And one more? Thanks. To test some, some, some hypothesis that can be drawn uh, from, from the literature. We, we, we have essentially eight international institutions that we look at, and BRICS, five countries, and uh, for each issue area, seven NGOs. With this, one can then, to some extent, check the hypotheses that are in the literature. I mean, one of them would be, as you clearly know, the more power a rising state acquires, the more or the less, depending on the version, its preferences uh, diverges from the status quo. Uh, the closer a rising power comes to parity with the dominant state, the more likely is it to challenge the status quo. Then we can take into account, to some extent, what role the domestic structure plays into those kind of demands. Uh, uh, there were the liberal, the more liberal states support stronger the liberal status quo or ask for more interventionist, uh, interventionist me measures. To which extent liberal states are really open to accept more uh, interventionist and uh, also more institutions with authority. Uh, as, composed to of, uh, as opposed to authoritarian states, which are often seen as essentially the most sovereignists, which should check both of those uh, dimensions. Uh, the same then, if we go on, applies also, uh, but there it's more difficult to, to uh, find a good hypothesis. We will work further on this on the civil society side, so we would expect, for example, that especially civil society NGOs as opposed to interest groups uh, favor more international authority. We would also expect that they favor more interventionist measures and less liberal measures. Uh, and of course, we would expect especially Western non-state actors to 
favor further liberalization. So that are the kind of hypotheses that we look at with the kind of conceptual frame that I have uh, presented. And the overall, overall goal is, in order to repeat this, to bring together two debates, two dis discourses, which are so far quite separate and which are almost impossible to understand separately because to a significant extent, the kind of demands directed by those two different types of actors towards international institutions are going exactly into the opposite direction, especially when it comes to the question of international authority, where many NGOs ask for more international authority, and many of the rising powers ask for less. And in that sense, there's a need to discuss this together. Thank you very much. So I'd just like to make a few observations about, I was going to actually make observations about the role of the BRICS in the G20, um, <clears throat> but I, f I fell short. So I'll just make uh, some considerations about uh, the role of the BRICS in um, governance nowadays and in the context of non-hegemonic world. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so I think there, there's been a lot, uh, quite a lot of expectation about uh, the role of the BRICS as uh, uh, contesting powers of, uh, uh, of the current world order or as powers that we would be co-opted by a reformed liberal order, um, given their uh, increasing role in multilateral uh, institutions. So um, my departing point is that, well, the BRICS are not so hot. Um, I don't think <coughs> they're, uh, they're really a force of contestation that might uh, change in any foreseeable future uh, in a substantive way, anything we call uh, like a world order, if we can call anything a world order nowadays. Uh, I think the, the interesting question is why the BRICS is perceived as a force of change in the current context, uh, since it is, uh, well, a very uh, uh, low density network, I would call it, of actors who have some identity but have very little effectiveness uh, and influencing uh, outcomes in certainly in multilateral institutions uh, and certainly in changing uh, international uh, political structures in any significant way. Uh, they've been more successful in cooperating among them. So in, uh, in um, intensifying trade relations or uh, cooperating in the financial uh, arena but in uh, mobilizing uh, political action uh, collectively, uh, they've been pretty weak. Uh, but the one thing, I, uh, my departing point is, uh, is the contribution of the BRICS uh, to the debate we're having here on changes in international order, uh, is that um, uh, either if you see it as a threat or or as a welcoming uh, a force, uh, I think uh, uh, the good thing about the BRICS is that uh, the emerging, they're, um, uh, they are contesting the idea uh, that there is a liberal order that's been expanded and that they will be part of it, uh, either as uh, competitors or as uh, uh, adherents. Uh, in that sense, the, the BRICS have contributed to a vision that is more plural uh, to the world order. Uh, they have uh, contributed to the de demystification of the idea that the liberal order was all inclusive, uh, that the colonial past was forgotten, and that there was some kind of uh, global arrangement uh, that would progressively uh, bring more autonomy and more freedom to most of the third world or through the participation, gradual participation 
of emerging economies in uh, the process of mod modernization. So this grand narrative of international order, of the liberal international order, which we've been hearing for uh, most of the last century and who many people still repeat nowadays. I think this, at least for those in the BRIC countries, uh, is really not to be taken seriously. Uh, so the whole debate about uh, you know, uh, liberal governance or global liberal governance, it's really uh, not, not an issue, at least I think for most people who are in the South or in the BRIC country. So it was an issue before perhaps when there was you know, the G77, the, uh, the opposition to the economic order, but nowadays nobody really cares. I mean, the narrative of the, this global liberal order has been discredited, I think, uh, not only by events, by, by, but also the BRICS have contributed to that in the sense that, well, there are many narratives of modernization, uh, there are many paths that have to be told, and there are many roles that these uh, states have performed in their own worlds, in their own regions, and in the worlds there are to come. So this is the first thing I think the BRICS have contributed to. It's very uh, um, ideational, I would say, but not only, but uh, certainly it discredits the liberal grand narrative of modernity, certainly. Um, so it shifts the discussion to how do we speak of the international order in a different way, uh, at least uh, shifting away from this uh, path dependency we're in of thinking that global governance is an expansion, uh, an expanded mode of internationali internationalizing authority through multilateral institutions in the very liberal uh, way we're used to. So this is my, my first point. The second point is a, as a way of introduction, is a, a conceptual objection to uh, uh, totalizing theories. I think, uh, other participants in this table have, have also uh, uh, dealt with the, the subject in this way. Uh, I think it's difficult to deal with the problem of change and transition with overarching theories or uh, grand theories about uh, global governance or, or any other uh, totalizing metaphor. So I think it's more, more useful uh, to deal with representations of, uh, well, uh, uh, dispersed power, decentralized networks, um, less statist narratives, uh, but certainly uh, non-hegemonic and decentralized uh, institutional and, uh, and social ties in, in the international order. So the enthusiasm about globalization, which was, I think, due to the possibility of thinking the world as a globe, integrated globe, I think that's, that's gone away as well. I mean, I think the idea that we will have uh, progressive integration and modernization and then an integration of political and economic institutions under the umbrella of the global governance discourse has also left us. And there, are, there are, I like to, to point out to a few, a few um, critical views of this, of this uh, narrative. Uh, well, I could just mention Schreller's dark uh, uh, view of this as an age of entropy and disorder, uh, but I'm not gonna uh, uh, develop much on that. I, w I would like to just come bring some uh, a very conventional, please the first, uh, the first uh, slide is uh, the very well-known historical materialist uh, story about the non-hegemonic uh, system, which is based on, on Cox uh, historical materialism. Uh, and this, and this uh, very well-known interplay between power institutions and ideas, uh, Cox makes a very compelling argument to the fact that you have uh, contending social forces today that are in, uh, disputing not only in the realm of uh, production, the transnationalization of production, but in labor, mobility, uh, democratization, and so forth, that makes the idea that you can progressively integrate uh, these uh, state society complexes in an overarching global order uh, rather 
uh, rather very less likely. So in this sense, uh, inequality, as Marcelo Neri said this morning, uh, has been rising within uh, countries and also internationally, if you don't consider China especially, uh, will intensify conflicts within emerging uh, powers, but also between emerging powers and, and the existing uh, global order. Not, not only because they will be uh, forced to given the very uh, intensifying level of conflict within these societies. Uh, the second point of uh, the second uh, uh, area of uh, variable actually of, uh, of Cox model is the diversity of state forms. So in, in the, the big narrative of liberal global order, we would uh, uh, have a progressive homogenization of states forms in the liberal democratic form. Uh, we're going the, the other way. Uh, I mean, we're going the other way uh, as far as democratization goes, as far as liberalization goes, as far as uh, forms of organizing a society and authority within states, uh, uh, be it in Latin America, different uh, experiments we're seeing here, such as Bolivia, Ecuador, and, and uh, elsewhere, uh, in Africa, or and even in uh, Asia. You have a and now certainly in the uh, north of Africa. So you have uh, many different state forms that don't reflect uh, an hegemonic, uh, hegemonic social forces and don't reflect uh, common ideas about how authorities should be organized. And uh, uh, as a consequence, in, in Cox's model, you have uh, different possibilities of world order, but you certainly don't have a, a dominant view about how the world is to be organized. So in this sense, Cox model gives us a, well, a very uh, simple, I would say, but a very compelling view uh, of contestation of order, but of a non-hegemonic sort. And uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, um, foresee uh, the progressive institutionalization of authority in the liberal world. Uh, the other model uh, I, also bring for discussion is a uh, well, uh, model more based on, on networks, which is the institution, institutional relational model developed by uh, Daniel Nexon in his book about the transition uh, uh, or, or the transition from, from um, uh, late Renaissance to modernity and the role of Protestantism in it. Uh, you can uh, change, and I'm sorry the way it's, it's presented. Uh, but what I take from here is just the idea that Nexon brings that uh, you have to look at social ties and networks to understand international political structures. And uh, depending on, well, the levels of uh, identification or what he said, categories and social positions of the actors and the density of networks, uh, you can uh, analyze whether certain processes and changes and uh, pressures on the uh, on the, uh, structures of international society will be more uh, likely to change or to uh, destabilize these structures. Uh, so when I look at, uh, uh, I was trying to look at the, at the BRICS in, in the global governance uh, uh, system, uh, I thought that uh, Nexon's model of uh, the international system th seen as a network of networks as an interesting way to think about the BRICS as uh, what he would call uh, a relatively high category, and this is the uh, left, high left uh, corner of the graph, uh, a relatively high category, low intensity network. Uh, and here the high category would be a certain uh, high identification of the BRIC countries as emerging powers or as formerly um, uh, uh, developing countries uh, as uh, what holds them together in, uh, in this group. And, and a low network given the low density, in fact, of their, of their interactions. Uh, however, uh, in this sense, it, it moves away from the low left corner, which is what uh, 
Nexon defines as the regular anarchical uh, model uh, of uh, be it the new realist and neoliberal new models, which is a low, low density network and a low category network where you have collective action problems. Uh, so the BRICS would try to move from uh, these, uh, from this situation and not move towards the right low corner, the right hand low corner, which would be the, the expected move from the BRICS, uh, at least from a liberal point of view, which is a move to a more high density network, even though they have a, a low category identification, which is the move of, well, more institutionalization. So instead of institutionalizing and bringing more density to the network, I would say that Nexon's uh, model uh, would be interesting to explain that why the BRICS remain informal and why the BRICS re re uh, resist to their own institutionalization and to you know um, relatively low density interaction between them. And that allows for uh, coordination, uh, not very effective coordination, but uh, uh, concentrated uh, uh, collective mobilization in high, in high importance uh, points. So in, that trigger their collective action, uh, action in certain levels. So this is the, uh, the uh, relational, institutional relation model uh, that would account for how the BRICS are organized, but how also they operate within institutions like, like, the, G, like the G20. Um, so in this sense for, for, for the, the BRICS, institutions uh, are not really reinforcing mechanisms of reproduction of the world order. Uh, well, they're, more, they're, they're used more instrumentally as uh, networks where they can coordinate their action uh, when, when the issue is relevant. And they haven't done that very often and not very effectively. So this is another way to look at the, uh, uh, the relationship between changes in world order and, and the role of the BRICS. Uh, the decline of monetarism as the main uh, idea uh, of regulation of uh, the uh, economic uh, uh, and financial order and the adjustment actually of the units to the necessities of uh, liberalization of international order. Uh, uh, austerity has been discredited as, as a policy or is being discredited. Uh, even the IMF is talking against austerity and the more orthodox monetary policies and the debate is centered around monetary policies of the US, which is an expansionist monetary policy. Um, and the critique of uh, uh, what's, well, the, 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 the problems in Europe is uh, a critique to its uh, overly orthodox uh, constraining and constraining monetary policy. So the decline of this uh, specific uh, uh, idea how the world is to be organized, points to the decline of the international economic order uh, main uh, regulative idea. Uh, the second point is the convergence of practices and policies, and here we, we see not a convergence, but more divergence, at least in certain areas, uh, which I will uh, exemplify very quickly in a minute. Uh, not only among G8 countries, but also uh, between the G8 countries and the BRIC countries. I think there is divergence in uh, practices and, and policies, especially in, in the economic area. And his third point is the consolidation of institutions. And here, well, this is a big debate because there are many institutions around, but we've been discussing the, the crisis of multilateralism. And if you think at least about the ambition of the post-90s, of uh, giving multilateral institutions a greater degree of uh, authority and legality. Uh, many of those institutions, like the WTO, uh, have been failing uh, uh, dramatically in uh, fulfilling their mandate to uh, liberalize uh, global trade um, continuously. Uh, we could say the same uh, about the UN and the crisis of the humanitarian regime we're living uh, nowadays. So the progressive institutional, institutionalization, and here Bisteca was referring more to the economic arena, of course, uh, is also 
under, under uh, scrutiny and also the lack of the, the, the ability to reform the, the small reform of the IMF quota, uh, uh, which was due this year, is also indicates uh, that Bristecker's model points to actually um, a decline uh, in uh, um, uh, a weakening of the international order of the 90s and the 2000s. And in this context, we can explain why the BRICS are so hot again. I mean, it's a permissive context where uh, uh, articulations, informal articulations, gain more influence uh, and more relevance than uh, very legalized and very institutionalized uh, institutions. Uh, so, and just to illustrate uh, what I was saying before, let's see, I used the, uh, the uh, G20 research group uh, data on compliance recommendations and, well, commitments by the G20 members in the last, uh, well, since the Washington summit in 2008. Uh, just to illustrate, I don't even, uh, I see Andrew is here and he will <laughs> probably have uh, something to say about this, but I use it in a, a bit liberal way. Uh, but yeah, the next one. So the, the compliance scores of the, of the G8 uh, since 2008, uh, to the time of 13, uh, are still have high scores. I mean, they overall have high scores, but you can see a certain level of, uh, of not of convergence, but a tendency to uh, disparity as far as uh, uh, compliance scores go uh, within the G8. Uh, the next, uh, please. And on the other hand, of the BRICS, you have well a relative convergence, even though in uh, a lower score uh, than, than the G8, uh, which indicates, well, there are some things the, G, the, the G20, uh, the BRICS actually can agree about within the G20 and they can converge in, especially in the uh, economic and financial area, um, but they would, uh, they have consistently remained at least in the last three years uh, at the same level of compliance. Whereas uh, within the G8, the level is still high, uh, but there's more disagreement between them. The last, uh, uh, well, it just illustrates compliance score gaps between G8 and the BRICS, which are slightly smaller. I only have the data, and uh, thank you again to the G20 Research Group for this, for this data. I only have the data for the last three years, uh, which indicate uh, that there, there remains uh, score gaps uh, between G8, G8 and the BRICS. So hence, the role of the BRICS and the G20 as far as uh, contributing to uh, a convergence uh, of policies in global governance has to be taken with a grain of salt. So as a conclusion, sorry about that, I'm taking too long. Uh, I have my conclusion in life, which should have it. So the conclusion is, um, I don't see, again, the BRICS as a significant force of contestation in world affairs, but uh, discussions about the cohesion of efficacy, role, and future of the BRICS, which are what the main critiques made to the BRICS, are of lesser importance and only re reveal a certain level of apprehension and insecurity from Western policymakers uh, who don't know what to make of uh, the BRICS within the context of, well, a liberal narrative of progressive modernity. The more interesting question, once again, is what um, uh, what uh, do the BRICS, as well as many other similar initiatives that have been discussed here, uh, of, of the, the informal nature, um, uh, in the recent times, that have appeared in the recent times, tell us about the capacity of the institutions and international political structures of today to resist the pressure from multiple and complex processes that challenge the arrangements in place that still claim to hold the system together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, well, my contribution is maybe surprisingly on the German case, on German foreign policy, and 
Um, Germany is usually not part of these conferences and um, publications on rising powers. I think it is still something like a strange animal, something in between traditional powers and rising powers. And um, I will uh, make this approach to uh, include Germany in the category of um, rising powers. Um, the lecture, not the paper, but the lecture uh, might be even uh, a little bit more empirical uh, also to, ver to ver a vary in comparison with the rest of the papers um, because some of the conceptual categories I'm um, basing on my, my arguments have been introduced already like legitimacy and networks so I can take it from there and uh, analyze mainly the, the German case. Um, something interesting uh, in the case of the German uh, foreign policy and the paper uh, is entitled Bound to Change Germany or German Foreign Policy in the Networked World Order. Um, something surprising is that despite its very material or very limited material resources, the external expectations uh, Germany is facing are growing um, and this in terms of uh, voices from countries one might not suspect to, to ask for German influence. Um, if I'm talking of very limited material capability, then I think in the military sphere it's very clear. Uh, Germany has no uh, nuclear capabilities, etc. cetera. Um, shrinking um, conventional military spending as well over the last 10 years or 15 years. Um, but also economically, especially if we um, consider the uh, prospective development, the demographical uh, development and the consequences that we'll have with, the, uh, with a view to the relative weight of the German economy and this uh, in stark opposition to the development that we can expect from the BRICS countries. Um, the voices that I'm mentioning are, for instance, Timothy Garten Esch, uh, who considers Germany an indispensable power. Um, there is a BBC ranking, uh, which shows that the majority of the global public, 59% uh, indeed, attested to Germany's positive influence in world politics, uh, which makes it very surprisingly uh, to me the most popular country of the world. Um, and there is also the Polish foreign minister who says that uh, he feared German power much less than German inaction. So one might expect that these, these voices come from very distant regions and societies that never met a real German, um, but um, indeed these are neighboring countries and country states that historically have suffered very much from German power projection, which makes them uh, even uh, more uh, influential um, sources of legitimacy and, and recognition. So um, what are the sources of this legitimacy that, that uh, seems to be on the rise in the case of Germany? It's uh, first some uh, very general sources of legitimacy, such as the multilateral approach of its foreign policy, um, general values such as human rights and democracy. But then if one goes deeper into these um, rankings and uh, arguments that the, the people made, um, then much more specific merits um, of the, the, the German past and present are mentioned, which is, for instance, how Germany is coming to terms with its past, uh, the social market economy, cutting edge and green economy, responsible budgetary policies, smart crisis management. So these are the sources of the legitimacy Germany is increasingly um, enjoying. And the foreign ministry was then thinking, how can we put these ideational resources capabilities into operation? And um, they developed an approach that there is a um, strategy paper entitled Shaping Globalization, uh, Expanding Partnerships, and the, the German Institute of Global and Area Studies has been involved in the development of this paper. And there are even more explicit references um, by other publications of, um, for instance, the uh, director of the planning staff of the foreign ministry, uh, which is entitled The Network Diplomat, um, in other words, there is a, more or less explicitly uh, a network approach which is pursued um, by the, the German government uh, since um, one or two years, um, I would say. Um, I understand network power as a subcategory of institutional power, focusing on how states project power uh, through issue-specific networks. 
and uh, foreign policy groupings. The, for the, the German case, and if one is uh, familiar to the lines of continuity in, in German foreign policy, then it is quite uh, um, an intense change or something like a new multilateral deal which is, reflect, which is reflected by this, um, by this approach um, from supranational institutions or more formalized institutions in the first place obviously the European Union towards um, policy oriented and policy specific networks which are much more flexible and informal as it has been mentioned um, by some colleagues already. There is one chapter in, in the paper uh, entitled the emancipation from Europeanized interests, meaning that there is something like a recovery of the national interest in the German case, that the national interest is not an equivalent anymore um, to, the, to the European interest, uh, something which becomes very clear um, in the Eurozone crisis. Um, I will not um, circumstance that point, um, but argue more on the, on the global level, which is the topic of today where we also can um, observe something like a re-socialization in power political terms, for instance, when Germany um, is seeking more power in multilateral institutions such as the UNSC, but at the same time increasingly less willing um, to delegate power sovereignty to these institutions. Um, so the best example for that is that Germany was not lobbying uh, for the UNSC through a European um, lobby network or a, a European group, um, but through the G4, and um, which is reflecting much more the modus operandi of realpolitik, uh, which should be very alien to civilian power, which is still the, uh, the self-image, uh, which is um, how Germany sees itself in, uh, as an international actor, and uh, most of the um, researchers and colleagues that work on foreign policy would um, defend this point that Germany still can be defined very much as a civilian power in international relations, uh, which is not, not seeking or pursuing in the first place its national interest. Um, the idea of networks, um, well, I have suggested a typology in, in, a, in another article um, distinguishing mediation, advocacy, and substitution networks. Um, I will not have the time to, um, to discuss that point here, but um, some general comparative and competitive advantages of network powers and also uh, have been mentioned already, but I will add some, uh, which is the privileged access uh, to information amongst these network members, shared learning processes amongst the network uh, members, and also greater credibility and uh, predictability, and, and they are also more familiar to their strategic approaches, which uh, makes it more easy to coordinate their interests and then uh, go to the G20 uh, wherever and uh, try to um, put into operation these, these strategies. Um, the network uh, power, let's say, or the influence of a net network power is most uh, pronounced if an actor is able to connect different clusters or groupings of states, for instance, established and, and rising powers. Um, this is the case of Germany, which uh, has special relations through the G4 to uh, Brazil and India on the one hand, and on the other hand is coordinating its foreign policies with its G8 partners, which are uh, industrialized countries or established powers. Uh, the same refers obviously to um, India and Brazil that also can be categorized as network powers, and that uh, is what I've done in the, in the third world quarterly piece. Um, but there are some additional arguments that potentially uh, prepare Germany better than others um, to, to utilize these interlockings and actively shape the global order through these networks, um, which are related very much to the political system of Germany, uh, which consists on the one hand of um, federalism, so there has to be a process of uh, consent seeking, which is the case of networks as well, uh, between the lenders of the federal states and the, the central uh, government. And then there is the uh, factor of coalition governments and also the uh, communitarian corporatism, which all depend highly on consensus building. 
Uh, another argument is the European Union and the socialization of uh, foreign policy makers, um, in particular um, the intergovernmental pillars of the EU can be seen as something as a laboratory of, of multipolarity and um, they have socialized German diplomats very much. And third, um, the specific composition of uh, foreign policy resources with the distinguished weight of ideational capabilities um, that I've mentioned, such as legitimacy, moral authority, which potentially able uh, Berlin to organize consensus in intergovernmental networks. Um, some empirical examples of networks that have been initiated lately uh, by the government in Berlin, uh, the last one has been the so-called Renewables Club. Um, in June of this year, the German environment minister invited 10 countries that have uh, defined themselves as, as pioneers in uh, climate policies and, and energy policies and they lobby for the deployment of uh, renewable energies worldwide. Another example would be the Petersburg Climate uh, Dialogue. In the latest edition, uh, Germany and Poland have invited 35 ministers to build consensus on the long-term uh, climate goals, which will be discussed at the Poland uh, summit this year of the, uh, of the UN. And there are other examples, um, networks conducted by the Ministry of Education and Research, for instance, and others. The this turn uh, from value-driven partnerships and communities towards um, interest-driven and issue-specific uh, networks uh, can be explained with a tendency that Germany is increasingly um, sharing interests in, in trade and finance with uh, countries which are not the traditional partners with whom or, uh, Germany shares the, the basic value of democracy, for instance, uh, meaning that the transatlantic alliance was traditionally is, is the, the very first framework of German foreign policy and German foreign policy thinking is divided on a, on a range of issues uh, which are value related from human rights but also uh, monetary policies, um, environmental policies, um, the balance between security and freedom uh, regarding the privacy laws, uh, many issues in security policies from death penalty to gun laws so there's a whole range of values which make it very difficult to argue anymore that there is something like a value community at which the transatlantic alliance is, is still framed by most uh, policy actors uh, in Germany. On the other hand uh, China is becoming the, the most important trade partner and buyer of German exports. On the other hand France, Netherlands, the US which are the traditional trade partners are losing ground uh, that will not be changed by the uh, free trade agreement, uh, free trade, free trade agreement between the U.S. and the European Union, as the first analysis at, at least um, argue. Um, however, that does not mean that um, in total there would be more interest, shared interest with um, authoritarian-ruled uh, rising powers, uh, because uh, China. Um, besides being a very important trade partner, is also a competitor in the race of, uh, for natural resources. And Germany's dependence on Russian en energy um, increases also the potential for political blackmailing. So obviously there are also lots of uh, interest differences with these players. And therefore um, foreign policy bargains through foreign policy networks seem to be much more instrumental um, than value-driven partnerships um, to shape the global governance issues that which are all, or most of them, very issue-specific. Um, then uh, getting to the, to the conclusion, uh, one of the preliminary results is that uh, Germany can be expected to um, pursue or, or show something like a functional leadership, which is a term from the middle power debate uh, also, also niche diplomacy might make sense as an uh, analyzing category in, in, in these terms, but Germany can be expected to play a role as such in certain uh, policy, um, uh, policies or issue areas such as climate change, uh, renewable energies, uh, knowledge society, etc. But most likely it cannot be exact, um, expected to play a role as such in the so-called high politics, uh, 
uh, and security issues, global security issues, uh, just because Germany is still playing much more the role of a consumer rather than a provider of global security. And um, there is a chapter in the, in the paper which is um, analyzing the a domestic debate in Germany between two camps. One is the, the anti-militarist camp and the other one are the global protectionist, um, R2P. We, we have discussed that already ex extensively. And I argue that, well, on the first, on the one hand, this, this uh, debate is highly um, undecided uh, and very, very ambivalent, as we could see in the case of Libya and, and Syria and the, the behavior of the German government. Um, but the, the limits of the um, degree of responsibility that uh, Germany will be able to take um, in, with regard to the global order, the future global order and its norms uh, will be limited by the outside or by the outcome of this debate between uh, global protectionists and, and anti-militarists. Thanks. Thank you very much. I haven't done that well. We've got maybe 20 odd minutes um, for questions. And I'm going to even reduce that because I'm going to say two things um, quickly before I open the floor. Just two kind of quick reactions. One, um, I mean, I thought uh, Michael's paper puts this issue about the sort of two worlds, what I call the hybrid order. You know, the world of the governancey folk and the world of the sort of power transition, power distribution people. And so much sort of really hangs on how we see that together. So, so Miles gives us, here's intergovernmentalism, and it's under threat, and lots of the BRICs have put lots of effort into it, but actually the world is really going somewhere else, and they're missing the boat, unless they connect with that. But one of the questions, of course, is, well, what is some of the power distribution conflict? Where does that play? So what if US, Europe get together, inspired by China, that not only makes the WTO even less important as a place, but presumably that sort of thing would have an enormous impact on the patterns of networks and alternative governance. So the, the hard power stuff plays in not just necessarily probably neutralizing the multilateral, but must also play into this other world. Um, Michael sort of gave us the question, what about the different sorts of realist-inspired hypotheses playing into this, but he didn't, of course, give us the answers that we need to have. And then, uh, on the other one, is we, are we, I just wonder whether we're talking enough about disequilibrium, about the instabilities. Um, and again, you know, the tendency is to focus on the narrow power ones as the big problem. But we, we've hardly mentioned the sort of the second face of power diffusion, diffusion to societies, all of that, mobilization. Um, we've hardly mentioned sort of instabilities of global capitalism. So my sort of wonder about the multiplex cinema is, sort of stable the walls between these different things and what are the forces that could destabilize them and aren't the forces that could destabilize them as much if you want to call it that to do with sort of Polanian problems rather than car and transition problems isn't that where the forces of, of instability and disequilibrium uh, really lie and so you know on the one hand putting the power side into the governancey one on the other putting a little bit more of the social maybe into the way in which we think about orders. That's my own thinking. 